Being a dad is one of the great privileges of my life. Give my son a BB gun and that's just about all the emotional support he needs. My daughter, on the other hand, I've heard people say that there are no differences between male and female. Those people are idiots. I'm a husband. I'm a father of four. I host a talk show. I give speeches. I write books. I like to make sense of things. But making sense of females is a whole other matter. Even astrophysicist Stephen Hawking, who could come up with a theory on black holes, was completely dumbfounded by women. Women. They are a complete mystery. And now our culture is telling us that the differences between girls and boys don't matter. That if you identify as something, then you are that thing. How do we help our kids make sense of this when they're bombarded with conflicting messages about gender and identity? Forget trying to figure out women. The real question is, what is a woman? As you grow, your body changes from that of a young girl to that of a woman. Soon, Molly will be a young woman, having dates, going to dances in lovely romantic dresses. The boy's shoulders are broad and his body muscular, while the girl's body is more curved. I'd like to know more about different kinds of hormones. The presence of these hormones in the blood brings about many changes in the bodies of both boys and girls. <laughs> Being a woman is one of the things I like best about myself. I think you'll like it too. I like to come out here to think. Nature seems to always tell the truth, even when we don't want to hear it. The truth is, I'm not very good at fishing. But what is truth? Is there a truth? Is this what progress looks like? Can my boys really become girls? Do I have four daughters? Do I now have to pay for four weddings? Is there a son trapped in my daughter's body? If so, how do I get him out? Are any of my kids who they claim to be? Who are these people? Who am I? In the state of Tennessee, I'm a licensed marital and family therapist, which basically means I've been trained up to think about like systems, family systems, how we were raised up, how that shapes who we are today. So on your website, if you'll, if you'll bear with me, sure. quoting, you say, I use a combination of approaches in my therapeutic work, including anti-oppression, feminist, and narrative frameworks. I rely deeply on systems theory and understanding that individuals are products of and in dialogue with our surroundings, including our families, broader culture, workplaces, nature, and political climates. What uh, does that mean? Yeah, um, so thinking about the modalities that I use, um, I'm definitely informed by like feminist um, family therapy um, and the ideas that um, we live in gendered worlds where there are certain imperatives that are placed on us about who we are and what we do based on how we've been gendered. From the minute I was assigned female, I was told, okay, these are the kind of clothing that you're gonna wear, these are the kind of, the, the type of play that you're gonna engage in as a child, um, the path that maybe your life will take because of social expectations. What do you, what do you mean by assigned female? Who, who assigns female? Yeah, so um, most times people, when they're born, um, they're assigned to gender. By the, the doctor. doctors. Yeah. yeah. Wait, what, do they, what do they base that? assignment on so basically it's it's based on genitalia um so people looking at genitalia and deciding okay this is a, a girl or a boy um and we know now that like that sex and gender are so much more than just this binary some women have penises right some men have vaginas um that that that's not how how gender works how do we know that how do we know that that's not true where, where do we where did we learn that from? Yeah, well, we I, I learned that um, from hearing from transgender people who've said, like, oh, I'm a trans woman. Um, and just because I happen to have a penis, right, that doesn't mean that this is, like, who I am as a person. Um, or, or that genitalia doesn't equal gender. Um, who they are, their gender, their gender expression, um, that 
Yeah, a trans woman is a woman. With the fluidity of these things, how do I know if, if I'm a woman? You know, I... I That's a great I question. Like, I like scented candles. And yeah. I've watched Sex and the City. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So how do I know? Yeah, Matt, that question right there, like, that question is, like, when it's asked with a lot of curiosity, right? That's the beginning of a lot of people's, like, gender identity development journeys. If my mom who gave birth to me is a woman, mm -hmm. and my wife is a woman, um, though I haven't asked her, maybe I should. Um, but if they're all women, and also the boy who sits down with you and says, I, I think I'm a girl, actually is one, then, then what is a woman? Mm. Great question. I'm not a woman, so I, I can't really answer that. I thought therapy would make me less confused. Am I the only one feeling this way? I need to hit the road and find out. We're talking about gender in society. Let me start with a real basic question. What is a woman? A woman? <laughs> I don't want to assume, but you guys are all yeah, women? We're all women. Yes, yes, we're women. So how would you define it, like in the simplest terms? That is hard. Yeah, it is. It is a stumper. A woman is someone that likes to be pretty and think of themselves as a delicate creature. I'm pretty and delicate. Okay. <laughs> I, I could be a woman too. Yes, you could. Defining womanhood is just a project of someone who identifies as a woman. Yeah, but what, like, what do they identify? You see what I'm saying? What do they identify as? They identify as a woman, but what is that? I honestly don't know. It's a simple question. So why is it so hard to answer? This is going to take some serious investigation. For all of human existence, women were understood to be a certain thing. So what changed? No one can seem to answer the question now. Over 2,000 surgeries and counting, Dr. Marcy Bowers is the nation's preeminent sex change surgeon. Surely someone who does sex change surgeries can answer what a woman is. Dr. Marcy Bowers, first of all, thanks for talking to us. My pleasure. So you're a world-renowned gynecologist and surgeon. You're also a transgender woman. Can you tell me a little bit about- Well, I mean, I, I identify as a woman. But you're a woman, right? I'm a woman with, I mean, that's my life mm -hmm. day to day. But I have a transgender history. Hmm. So one one thing on your website, it says uh, gender affirm GAV, gender affirming vaginoplasty. Mm -hmm. What is that exactly? A vaginoplasty is creation of, of female, uh, a female vagina and vulva. We're altering the physical characteristics of the individual to, to fit better with a gender identity that, that is female. This is all constructed from the penis? Yes, that's right. The surgeries are quite refined in the sense that they really, not only do they look like female anatomy, but they also function that way, for the most part. I mean, certainly it's a bit of a Faustian bargain. You know, it's not perfect. Does anyone ever regret their Surgeries? Are, well, we know they do, but how often do people regret their surgeries? Well, actually, we don't know that they do. There are legitimate detransitioners, and there are people who truly feel that in their journey, they may have made a mistake. Now, fortunately, this is a really, really uncommon phenomenon. I don't know if you've ever heard of people in the trans-abled community. These are people who are physically able-bodied but feel like they should be disabled or identify as such. Uh, for example, a man who has two arms but feels like he should have one. If a, if a man in this kind of marginalized community was went to the doctor and said, I want to have my arm cut off, do you think that? That, that doesn't have anything to do with gender identity. Well, it's uh, so someone's 
someone's self-identity, how someone identifies. That's, sounds, that's someone who has a, um, a, and I'll accept it as a mental diagnosis, a psychiatric condition. I don't even pretend to know what aptomenophilia is all about, but somehow it's the idea that you, you know, you're fascinated or charmed by having a limb or part of a limb missing. Mm. Okay, I would say that's, uh, pardon my non-medical language, kooky. You don't see any? You think this is totally irrelevant? Yep. So the biggest, broadest question is, what is a woman? A woman is a, you know, it's a combination of your physical attributes and then what you're showing to the world and the gender clues that you give. And hopefully those match your gender identity. The critics on the other side of this, of, uh, of, this, of this issue. There aren't many, but go ahead. There aren't many who would disagree with what you're saying about? Well, you know, the dinosaurs of the world are certainly out there. How long have you been uh, running the shop here? 25 years. Wow. Now, you had an incident here a little while ago that went really viral online. Uh, lots of reaction in the public. Aberdeen Councilwoman Tiesa Meskius confronted owner Don Sucker about a sign he posted in his store. One day, I just put the sign up over here, and uh, he came around the corner, and I thought, OK, I recognize him. I says, uh, oh, I recognize you. You're our new city councilman. He says, no, I'm your new city council woman. So it was, it was kind of on from there. You know what? It's bullshit. No, what you're spouting is bullshit. Uh, no, it's not. It Trans is... women are women, sir. That sign is bullshit. I've been doing this 25 years. I've never had a problem with anybody, whether they're gay, transsexual, anything. Now, you're saying council man, he, this individual was saying, I'm a woman. Right. And, then, and you said you're not a woman. How, how, how do okay. you know that that person's not a woman? How do I know? Yeah. Well, uh, common sense. Trans women it are women! Doesn't, doesn't the science say that if someone identifies as a woman, then they are? No, no. Now, that's completely bogus. I don't care if you think you're a sheepdog and you come into my store, it don't matter to me. Just don't come in and try to shove that shit down my throat. If it makes someone feel better, what about their, their feelings? I, mean, I don't give a shit about their feelings. I'm old. What about the Star Wars universe? Jar Jar Binks, pansexual, do you think? Transgender? Um, why, would I, why would I even care? It's, if it's his truth. Well, it ain't true. You're not a scientist, you're not a gender studies major, or are you? No. no. Okay. How do you know that you're a man? How do I know that I'm a, I guess because I got a dick. Huh. Well, I guess Don isn't overthinking it. He admits he's not a gender studies major, or at the very least a doctor. Maybe I should go talk to one. My name is Michelle Forcier, um, and I have a medical degree from University of Connecticut Residency, University of Utah Pediatrics, and I've worked for a number of different Planned Parenthoods for 20 years. I do advanced contraception and abortion, as well as gender hormones, and sort of looking at the whole sort of schema of gender, sex, and, and reproductive um, justice. So you've done a lot of work in this field. Could you just start by telling us? Sure. Uh, at what age can a child first begin to transition into another gender or identify themselves as a gender different from how they were born? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's research and data that show that um, babies and infants um, understand differences in gender. Some children figure out their gender really early. And the reason why we are say, oh, that's, that's interesting or important is because they're figuring out their gender identity is not necessarily congruent with their sex assigned at birth. When the, when the doctor sees the penis and says, this is a male, has the sex of male, that's an arbitrary distinction? Telling that family 
based on that little penis that your child is absolutely 100% male identified no matter what else occurs in their life, that's not correct. So what is gender affirmation care? You're a big proponent of, if we walk through yeah. a child is sitting down with you, is questioning yeah. their gender, what's the gender affirmation process? Affirmation means that as a pediatrician, as someone who says my job is to provide the best medical care for you, is I need to listen really carefully. And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? And more excitingly, where would you like to be in the future? Have you ever met a four-year-old who believes in Santa Claus? Mm-hmm. So this is someone who believes that a fat man is traveling through the sky on a flying reindeer at lightning speed, coming down his chimney with presents. Would you say that this is someone who maybe has a tenuous grasp on reality? They have an appropriate four-year-old handle on the sure. reality Agreed. that's very real for them. Agreed. Agreed. But Santa Claus is real for them, but yeah. Santa Claus is not actually real. Yeah, well, and, but Santa Claus does deliver their Christmas presents. Well, yeah, but he's not real, though. To that child, they are. When I see a child who, you know, believes in Santa Claus, and then let's say this is a boy and he says, I'm a girl. Mm -hmm. This is someone who can't distinguish between fantasy and reality, so how could you take that as a reality? I would say that as a pediatrician and as a parent, I would say how wonderful my four-year-old and their imagination is. Aren't kids famous for their active imaginations? Should we really let our children define reality? If I say that I, I feel a certain way, then obviously you can't tell me I don't feel that way. Yeah. But just because I feel that way, does that mean it's, that it's true? I mean, if it's your reality, okay. I, Yeah, if it's your reality, it's too. It's truly, like, none of my business who you So are. we all have our own Identity. realities? What if I said, I want you to say that it's true that I'm a woman? Would you say that? Okay, you're a woman. I would also say that. If you want. I, yeah. I, I honestly don't care, like, whatever makes you happy. What's true to you can be, can be false to me. So like, it, it's not, it's like... What if I said that it's true, my truth is that you don't exist? Does that mean you, you no longer exist? I mean, if that's your truth, sure, I don't. Because but, it's But like, you do. Well, I mean, if you're saying that I do, then I do. Well, but even if I said that you don't, you still do, because we're, we're having this conversation. I mean, are we? I think so, I mean, I thought... That's what you think. Well, I should have known it would be hard to define reality in Hollywood. I should probably look to the place where truth is the foremost pursuit, the American University. What we do in, in gender studies is not just reduce gender to what psychologists might call individual differences, but rather thinking about gender, and that's not women and man, but gender as a, as a social form, something that kind of infuses itself into virtually all aspects of social life. Well, let's talk about that then. Uh, I guess we should start with, we've got gender and sex, right? Yeah. What, what's the difference between the two? Is there a difference? I saw that in your questions and I thought, my goodness, this is what we spend an entire semester kind of thinking through. But what we tend to think about in the social sciences today is that sex refers to a set of biological characteristics and gender is a social construct or category. What I think is often misleading about that characterization is allowed to be sort of messy and complicated. But in that framing, when you split them up into these wholly discrete constructs, studies scholars, and, and really more specifically people who study gender and sex, we're not talking about sexuality right now. In the kind um, of academic universe that I travel in is that we see how deeply gendered ideas, um, cultural ideas about masculinity um, and femininity, maleness and femaleness, both in humans and in lots of other animals. So are gender and sex two different things, or? Well, I think that they, they both are 
and they aren't. I'd be, I'm comfortable saying that gender and sex are, are two different constructs, but they're deeply intertwined with each other. We're talking about gender and, and sex, and there's a lot of controversies there. If we're talking about a trans woman has all of the male physical characteristics, so would that not be a male then? Couldn't, couldn't we plainly say this person is a male? Well, wh well I guess it's, it's like, wh why are you asking the question? I think I, I, wa I want to understand sort of why that's so important. So if someone tells Just you... Just to, uh, to sort of understand reality, you know? Well, I mean, I think when someone tells you who they are, you should believe them. So if a person says that they're a woman or they're a man, then that's them telling you their gender is. I'm, I'm not so sure why, what social um, in interactions would have to do with, with maleness or femaleness that would well, be- I'm not even talking about social context. I'm just, I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable with that language of like g getting to the truth. Again, in social why, why life, is that, why is that uncomfortable? Because that it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and the if truth? you and, and if you keep probing, we're gonna stop the interview. I if I probe I, about what the truth is, you keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. I'm saying is, to you, how is the word truth condescending and rude? Why don't you tell me what your truth is, and you're walking on. 30 seconds more of the nights before I get up. What my truth is? Well, I don't think I really have a truth. I think that there's just the truth, like the reality. And so we should begin by trying to figure out what the reality is. Uh-huh. And why are you concerned with when someone else tells you that they're a man, or even if they use the word male, why are you concerned with not believing them? Well, you keep bringing it back to, you know, how do you respond in a social situation, but... That's what I do. I'm a social scientist. Well, right, but we're in a university. This is a place of understanding truth, isn't it? Or... Absolutely. We, are, we pursue the truth, is... truth, and so I'm a social scientist, and that's what I but do. But you just said the truth is transphobic. Th that you would say, that you're, if you're saying the truth is that I get to say, you're not a man, show me your genitalia, that's transphobic. No, no, yes. I don't want to see anybody's genitalia. I, I, I just mean... Someone can make a statement about themselves that could be untrue. Like, for example, if I, if I were to say that I'm a black man, could you, would you accept that or would you be skeptical? Are you black? Are you African American? Are you biracial? I don't think so. Yeah, well, you don't look that, and I don't think that's a, that, it doesn't sound like that's a genuine statement of who you are. Okay, so that's my point. I, I could make a statement about who I am that's incorrect. Of course, I think it's well established that human beings can lie, yes. Or not even lie. I mean, I could just be mistaken. Yeah. I'm uh, not sure where you're going. I guess this all comes back, just, this all comes down to really one question. Um, especially women, gender, and sexuality studies. So, so what... What is a woman? Why do you ask that question? I just really like to know. What do you think the answer to that question is? Well, I'm, I'm asking. That's why I came to a college professor who, who's, this is your, this is what you do. What other kinds of answers have you gotten? A lot of like this, where you're where you're not answering, and I've gotten a lot of that. So I think it's interesting that you that you say that some of the people you've you've um, interviewed have been um, reluctant to answer it, and I think that has a lot to do with the way the questions that preceded it and the the way that you've conducted yourself in the interview. How have I conducted myself? How do you think you've conducted yourself? You, you, <laughs> you just really don't want to answer the questions, do you? I, I came today very willing and, and enthusiastic about answering questions about women's and gender sexuality studies, which is so the you work wanted that to, I do. You wanted to answer questions about women's studies, and so shouldn't the, the first answer you should be able to provide is what exactly is a woman? Well, it's, it, for me, it's, it's actually a really simple answer, and that's a person who identifies as a woman. But what are they identifying as? Uh, as a woman. But, but what is that? As a woman. Do you know what a circular definition is? I do. It's sort of like 
what you're doing right now, where a, a woman is, is a woman. Mm -hmm. Well, because you're seeking what we would call in my field of work an essentialist definition of gender. I think it sounds like you would like me to give you a set of biological or cultural characteristics that are associated with one gender or the other. I'm not seeking any type of definition. I'm just seeking a definition. Yeah, and I gave you one. Well, now I can say I've been to college. Glad I didn't pay for it. Is there anyone willing to give me a straight answer? Ideally, somebody with a bunch of medical degrees on the wall. Dr. Grossman, thanks for talking to us. You're a psychiatrist, medical doctor, and you've done a lot of work in child psychiatry. What is transgenderism from a psychiatric standpoint? The best way to approach it is by speaking about gender dysphoria, which is an intense loathing and discomfort with one's biological sex. They exist anywhere between one in 30,000 people and one in 110,000. It's important to distinguish those people from what's happening much more recently, which is kids that never had any um, discomfort or dysphoria, as it's now called, with their biological sex. And then quite suddenly, as preteens or as, as adolescents, they come out and they announce that they are gender fluid or they, they start to question their sex. So first, let's define the terms sex and gender. Yes, please. Sex is biology. Sex is unchanging. It's based on chromosomes. 99.999% .99 of the cells in the body are marked either male or female. Gender, on the other hand, is a perception. It's a feeling. It's a way of identifying. It's, a, it's an experience. OK, that's, that's subjective. It sounds like what you're saying is that if a man is male but thinks of himself as a woman, he's not actually a woman? That's correct. Male gametes. That's what makes me male. No, your, your sperm don't make you male. Then what does? It's a constellation. In reality, in truth, OK? Whose truth are we talking about? The same truth that says we're sitting in this room right now, you and I. No, you're not listening. If I, if I see a chicken laying eggs and I say that's a female chicken laying eggs, did I assign female? Or am I just observing a physical reality that's happening in the world? Does a chicken have gender identity? Does a chicken cry? Well, does chi a chicken commit suicide? Let's frame it, it because you're talking. You're trying. A chicken to, has sex, like any like any biological organism. A chicken has organism. an assigned gender, but a chicken doesn't have a gender identity. So we assign female to chickens when they lay eggs. That's a, we that's, assume they're female if they lay eggs. Now I was told that really everyone agrees with the current approach to gender and transitioning kids and all of that. And if you don't agree, that you're a dinosaur and a bigot. So. Are you a bigoted dinosaur? I'm not bigoted and I'm not a dinosaur. I am rooted in reality and in science. Whose reality? There's one reality. The first race that I competed against a transgender athlete was during my freshman year. And once the gun went off, the two transgender athletes took off flying and left all of us girls in the dust. For about all four years of high school, I was forced to compete against biological males. I only competed against them in the sprinting events, but I raced against these athletes over a dozen times throughout the years, and every single time I lost. Did, did they inch you out of medals that you would have won otherwise, or trophies you would have they won? They beat me out by 20 meters out of medals, and qualifying spots, I missed out on qualifying for New England's. I had, and I had to go in the long jump and the four by 200 meter relay, so I was forced on the sidelines in my own event, and if they were not there, I would have been able to qualify. So I missed out on so much throughout my high school career. Did they win all the events or almost all the events? Between the two of them, they won every single event they competed in. How does that, how does that feel? It is so 
frustrating and heartbreaking because we elite female athletes train so hard to shave just fractions of a second off of our time. And going into races knowing that we will never be able to win. It feels like all that work gone to waste. It does. After so many losses, it just gets to the point of, why am I even doing this? Why am I keep training so hard and sacrificing so much just to place third and beyond? Case in Connecticut, there were two male track runners. Trans they were trans girls. Right. And who, who decided that um, they were going to race against the girls. And you look at the, those individuals, you look at their times, against the men, against the boys, so they were kind of middle of the pack. And then they're racing the girls and they're, you know, first and second place. Is that indicative of some kind of unfair advantage that those individuals might have against the girls? No, it's not indicative of an unfair advantage. And I think part of the proof of this is that more transgender girls are coming out in high school and still playing sports and they're not winning. You know, the Connecticut case is the exception. Um, it got a lot of attention because those two trans girls performed well, but there are many, many yeah. more trans girls competing in sports and they don't excel. Yeah, because we can, at the we, end of the day, whether yeah. or not you win a game is not ju is about how hard you work in your practice and most of us aren't gonna win. And that goes for transgender athletes too. Let's go girls. The norm is that transgender youth don't win that much in sports games. Alana McLaughlin was very appreciative for Provost to take this fight. I don't know how appreciative it is now, but she got a couple punches in. It is the very much the exception when a transgender young person does win. And the this tap! And it's because there's not really an advantage to being trans. Um, only a few people are going to lead the pack. There are some slight differences, but does it translate to a competitive advantage? I think you'd be very hard pressed to prove that. If there was a big advantage to being transgender in sports, then we would see transgender women totally dominate. And over the last half of the pool, nobody will touch Leah Thomas. I feel like a woman. Transgender swimmer Leah Thomas breaking barriers and records. But in a new article, Sports Illustrated calls the college senior the most controversial athlete in America. Leah obviously helps us do better, right? Leah's swimming really fast. Leah's performance helps the University of Pennsylvania swim team. The feeling of winning doesn't feel as good anymore because it feels tainted. There was a lot of things you couldn't talk about that were very concerning, like a locker room situation. If you even brought up concerns about it, you were transphobic. If you even bring up the fact that Leah swimming might not be fair, you were immediately shut down as being called a hateful person or transphobic. But there's never any conversation. The coaches don't sit everyone down and acknowledge what everyone's really upset about. So Penn actually brought in people high up in the athletic department to talk to us. They brought in someone from like the LGBTQ center. They brought in someone from the psychological services. So you, you're upset about what's happening. And so yeah. you need psychological help. Yeah. And they told us in this meeting, they said, look, we understand there's an array of emotions, but Leah's swimming is a non-negotiable. However, we can help you make that okay. That's what we're here for. So you're anonymous for this interview. Why did you decide that you can't have your face out there saying these things? They've made it pretty clear that if you speak up about it and you say anything negative, that like your life will be over in some way. Like You'll be blasted all over the internet as a transphobe if you come out, and then you'll never be able to get a job. Like Anyone who wants to hire you will look you up and see you're transphobic and your life will be over. Let's say that I identified as a woman tomorrow and I wanted to go into the same locker room where you are. Should I be allowed to do that? As long as I identify that way? I don't know. I just feel that other women would be uncomfortable by you walking in there. She says that what do you think about the women who are transsexual use the baths of women? Do you think it's okay? No. But tell it. No, look at the end of 
controversy at a health club in Koreatown over the issue of gender. That's right. Video of spa goers complaining was posted on social media. I just want to be clear with you. It's okay. It's okay for a man to go into the women's section, show his penis around the other women, young little girls under age. Your spa, we spa, condone that. Is that what you're saying? Like I asked. It's so he, so he can stay there. He can stay there? Most sexual orientation. I see a dick. Police identified the person involved as 52-year-old Darren Moreger of Riverside County. Moreger, who has been a registered sex offender since 2006, now faces five felony counts of indecent exposure. Hello, I'm Congressman Mark Ticano. Trans Month of Visibility is a time to recognize the strength, diversity, and resiliency of the transgender community. Together, we can make our country and our world a more accepting place by speaking out against transphobia at the source and supporting the trans community by getting the Equality Act signed into law. Congressman, thank you for, for being here. Thanks for joining us. You are the first member of Congress who's a member of the LGBT community and also a person of Asian descent. You're also a big proponent of the Equality Act. Yes. Um, what is the Equality Act? If you were to just summarize it very briefly, I know it does a lot. The most simplest way to talk about the Equality Act is that it simply amends the 1964 Civil Rights Act to include sexual orientation and gender identity. So public accommodations um, is one area. What's a way that someone who's LGBT is, could be discriminated in public accommodations currently? Currently, um, you know, public accommodations is the whole area of, um, you know, hotels and motels and... Bathrooms and sports teams, is that... I say bathrooms, yeah. sports teams, athletic events. Let's get into more specific policy issues. There, there are some women who say, and I've, I've talked to a few who say this, they say, hey, you know, I'd like some privacy in the bathroom. Uh, I'd prefer not to encounter you know, naked penises, frankly. Uh, they say even that the penis is a telltale sign that someone is a male. I mean, there, there are people who have kind of really bought into the, to the rumor that um, only men have penises. What, how do we account for that? How do you respond to that? Um, well, um, Well, what I would say is that uh, most transgender people uh, that I know, um, and it's a very, I think, distinct minority of people. It's a very, it's a, it is a, it is a very, I think, uh, we're talking not about a lot of people. Um, I think a person who wants to use a woman's bathroom who identifies as transgender really does think of themselves as a female. So how we go about trying to, um, you know, uh, respect their basic right to live, I think will be an, an important part of this law. And um, With the bathrooms, law. well, wait a minute, ba bathrooms are, bathrooms are, you know, where you want to take this conversation instead of the basic right to just life is something that I'm kind of mystified that you're kind of not focusing on first, that we're going straight to the controversy over bathrooms. Um, hmm. So, you know what, I think this interview is over. Yeah, I yeah. think we're gonna I think, I think this I interview said, is over. I just had one last question. Uh, what, well, I, 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 what, the interview's what, over. Please we want to know what, what is a woman? Please. Let's turn off the cameras. Excuse me. So we're going to end the interview. If you guys could please pack up and return the office exactly. I just wanted to know. Okay. Thank I came you. all this way to know what. Thank you. They're fair. I just wanted to know what is a woman. And you're not going to find out. My trip to California isn't providing many answers, but. At least I'm making new friends. You worry about kids walking around out here? No, because uh, I raised two daughters. They're 
two of the most well-adjusted adults. They grew up around naked people, and uh, there's been studies that have shown that children raised around non-sexual nudity actually have fewer hang-ups when they're adults. People do have hang-ups. There's a lot of things hanging right now yep. during this conversation. Uh, can anyone be any gender they want to be? Can a man become a woman if he wants to be? I leave that. I mean, what people do, what, that's personal choice. People can live the life they want to. I'm, I'm trying to live uh, the life I want to, an authentic yeah, life, and I, I can see that's that. why I respect other people's rights and ch to choose what they want to do. Well, why are you asking a gay man as to what it means to be a woman? You should be asking women what it means to be a woman, especially trans women, who, what it means to well, be women. I'm asking all kinds of people. Can anyone have an opinion about it? Only people who are women. Gay men don't know nothing about what it means to be a woman. Have you told gay men here in San Francisco that they're not allowed to talk about this? No. But I have, it's not like I come around and say what a gay man is allowed to be. So you're saying, so you're saying if you're not a woman, then you shouldn't have an opinion. Where does a guy get a right to say what a woman is? Women only know what women are. Are you a uh, cat? No. Can you tell me what a cat is? This is actually a genuine mistake. I am sorry I even came up here. You want to tell us what a woman is? If my friend in the purple hat is correct, and only women can tell me what a woman is, I guess I need to go where the women are. What, what is a woman? Can you tell me that? Oh, <laughs> well, you're at the Women's March. You must have some idea. So, I see girls, vagina. Does that mean that they're the only people who can get pregnant? If men can get pregnant too, I think they'd want the right to choose. But they, but men can get pregnant? We're saying someone who was born as a woman but identifies as a man. That, Is that a man? real man. It's a real man? Yeah. So, they can, so men can get pregnant? Yes, if we're saying it. Yes. If they have the parts to do so. Is it just women that give birth or is it? Or I guess, yeah. So, so, men, so men can give birth too? with a vagina. Well, that could be a man or a woman. Well, I mean, I think that's the whole point, right? That it's fluid. The way that we define these things changes a lot. What are you doing here? I'm asking these questions. Okay. I'm trying to figure out what a woman is. That's why I'm here. And this is the Women's March. I figured this is a good place to find out. I've come all this way to ask that question. Can anyone tell me what a woman is? you are not here for women, we ask you to leave. What is that? How am I harassing? I'm asking a question. Our bodies are choice. Whose body? What, what is a woman? Can, can anyone here at the Women's March tell me what a woman is? How about you tell me what a woman is and I'll put a mask on? Sir, tell me what a woman is and I'll put a mask on. Please, if, if one person could tell me what a woman is. Do you guys know what a woman is by any chance? No idea. I've been all over America. I still can't find an answer. Maybe I'm looking too close to home. and talk to you guys, thousands of miles from, from America. So thank you for inviting us into your tribe, first of all. I can say it is my pleasure to, to meet you and uh, feel most welcome, but uh, you are here to learn with me. I'm here to learn with you too. Great.
What's the right form here? He's still. Just with the elbow? Yeah. I mean, they're laughing, so I guess it's not good, but <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Not good enough to be a man yet in your tribe, but what does a man do? What, what are his roles within the tribe? At the role of a man, you need to work for your woman. Secondly, to have children. If you have children and you don't have something to feed them, you are not still a man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's the blood. This is the best raw kidney I've had in my life. <laughs> what if a man decides that he wants to do the roles of a woman? Uh, in Maasai community, it will not exist at all. Doesn't exist? What if a man decides that his, his gender identity is, is woman? A woman has its own duty, and a man has its own duty, and a lady cannot do the duty of a man, and a man cannot do a duty of a woman. Can a man become a woman? No. No? No. What about a transgender? Transgender? No. No? It will look like to, if you want to become a lady but your man, you have something wrong in something your mind. Wrong something wrong in your family, something wrong in you. What about if someone was non-binary? Come again? Non-binary? Uh-huh. Do you know, like non, like uh, someone is, is. Uh, you're not a woman, you're not a man. Yeah, someone's like, someone is, is neither, there's something else, is that? I'm mm -hmm. He's saying we have never seen things like those. For a man, he has a penis. For a woman, he has a vagina. So we know this is a lady, this is a man. What if it's a woman with a what if it's a woman with a penis? What? <laughs> <laughs> People are laughing. Is that, is that a dumb question? <laughs> uh, they're just laughing because they have never heard something like that. This is their first time. To hear never heard a, it before. A, a woman have a penis and she is a woman. In my country, I can't go a day without hearing it. We hear it every day. So in my country, sometimes you'll hear people say, a man will say I, that I'm a, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. And so they say, that I have a woman trapped inside me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they want to know a woman has the breast. Breast. Yeah. <clears throat> Secondly, he has, she has a vagina. Vagina. And the question is, does this man deliver? Does he deliver babies? <laughs> <laughs> No, not as far as I know. <laughs> the question is, let's say if you want to sleep a woman, definitely you'll do sex. Sex with a woman, yeah. And you f the vagina, is it? But yeah. for the man, where do you f He asked that question. I don't know all the logistics of it. <laughs> uh, based on what I'm saying, would you ever want to move to America? <laughs> they say no, never. What is a woman if you had to give it 
a definition. <laughs> She's saying, a woman delivered, yeah. a man cannot. So it sounds like you, all, you don't spend a lot of time thinking about gender. You, don't, you just kind of live your lives, you don't think much about it? He said, no, because we believe that's a God plan. God's plan? He's saying that I'm shocked <laughs> on what you are telling me. He's shocked? Yeah. The Maasai people don't think much about gender, but they have a firm sense of their identity. It's clear that gender ideology is a uniquely Western phenomenon. So where did all this come from? Who came up with it? And why? Matt, I, I, want, I want to show this to you. You're a parent, right? Okay? It's, it's perfectly normal for 10 years and up. Here's just one page I want you to see here. For 10 and up, huh? It's, it's unspeakable what these people have done to our children. When did that start? When was it decided that we need to start teaching kids about this stuff at such a young age? So I'll answer that with one word, Kinsey. Kinsey was a social reformer. He wanted to rid society of Judeo-Christian values when it came to sexuality. And he worked very hard to do that, and I would say he succeeded. Kinsey would be very happy with our culture today. His idea was that children are sexual from birth, that we're all inherently sexual creatures from cradle to grave. He believed that true happiness is found in a life of perverse sexual experimentation, no matter the age. What came out is that his research was fraudulent. Kinsey based his fraudulent conclusions on data he collected from convicted sex offenders and child molesters. His research was conducted in prisons, not everyday America. He also performed horrific sexual experiments on children, some under the age of one. His most influential book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, contains an infamous chart called Table 34, which documents the orgasms of very young kids, including babies as young as five months old. But instead of suffering the consequences for his heinous actions, he was and still is celebrated by academia and Hollywood. His ideas form the foundation for sexual education in public schools today. How do we get from this to you can choose your own gender? Okay, well now we have another a very important character, and his name was John Money. John Money was a psychologist and professor at Johns Hopkins University. Gender ideology was his brainchild. In fact, he coined the terms gender identity and gender roles. And according to Money, babies are gender neutral at birth, and ultimately environment determines whether a person is a man or a woman. Money was telling the world about his theory that a boy could be raised as a girl, and do just fine, and vice versa. And so Money tried out his theory on two young twin boys, the Reimer twins. When the twins were eight months old and they went to be circumcised, the first twin, whose name was Bruce, um, something went wrong with the machinery and his penis was burnt off. They stopped and didn't do a second circumcision on the other twin, as you might imagine. And the parents, of course, didn't know what to do. How are they going to raise this child? John Money convinced Bruce's parents to transition him into a girl. Money also conducted sexually abusive experiments on the twins throughout their childhood, including forcing them to simulate sex acts on each other. He reported up to the age of 10 that this was a complete success. Well, it wasn't true. The results were a disaster. Bruce could never fully accept his female identity. Eventually, his parents told him the truth, and he chose to transition back to a boy, taking the name David. As an adult, David spoke out about the abuse and the damage done to him by John Money. The girls would do their things with their Barbies and things like that, and that wouldn't interest me. Mm -hmm. And uh, things such as trucks and uh, building forts and uh, you know getting into the odd fist fight and mm -hmm. climbing trees. That's the kind of stuff that I like, but it was unacceptable, so I'd never... As a girl? As, as a girl, I had no place to, to fit in. The trauma that he and his brother and his entire family went through left deep scars. His brother died of an overdose uh, when he was 38, 
and then David died, committed suicide. There was never a retraction or an apology from John Money. Instead, his ideas were adopted by mainstream psychology, and they form the basis of gender ideology today. Why don't more people know about John Money and Alfred Kinsey? Evidently, there are forces that don't want this information out. I, I never fit. I was, a, I was an alpha female, a, a sales executive that kind of just didn't fit in any box. When psychologists or somebody that I was in love with or whatever said that I was in the wrong body, I started to think, well, maybe I am. I'm a biological woman that medically transitioned to appear like a male through synthetic hormones and surgery. I will never be a man. Is it transphobic for me to tell the truth? Why is it then a couple hundred years from now, if you dug up my body, they're gonna go, yep, yeah, that was a woman, had babies. Can you tell me about the procedures that you, you had? I've had seven surgeries. I've had one stress heart attack. I've had a helicopter life ride uh, with a pulmonary embolism. I've had uh, 17 rounds of antibiotics. I had six inches of hair on the inside of my urethra for 17 months. Nobody would help me, including the doctor that did this to me, because I lost my insurance. I get infections every three to four months. I'm probably not going to live very long. Was there any real discussion of the risks and the side effects? And No. No, there's not. And I know that people want to think that there is, but there's not. The truth is, is that medical transition is experimental. We have um, studies that said that medical transition helps mental health, helps mental health with kids. They've all been retracted, modified, changed. But the only long-term study tells us seven to 10 years is when transgender people are the most suicidal. After? After surgery. But that's transphobic to say. For the first time in history, a marginalized group has a huge dollar sign on the top of their head. We have five children's hospitals in the United States promoting that. And what? That's a phalloplasty. That's a bottom surgery. We have five children's hospitals in the United States telling girls that they can be boys at $70,000 a pop in a surgery that has a 67% complication rate. That will kill me from infection that I can't sue on. We're butchering a generation of children because nobody's willing to talk about anything. I have three kids at the age that they're doing this to kids. I'm not transphobic. I love my kids, and I love other people's kids, and you should too. This is wrong on so many levels. Can kids consent? Do you think kids are no. capable of consenting to this? No, they're not. Being a parent is loving the hell out of your kids and helping them see around corners. What's the, what's the youngest patient that you've operated on? The youngest patient I've done vaginoplasty on um, is age 16. Do you worry that minors just don't understand enough about themselves? They're not neurologically developed enough yet to make permanent life-altering decisions? Absolutely not. A young person's self-perception, one day they may be clear, the next day they may be totally confused and not sure, and you're affirming it with hormones that have never been used in this way in the, in the field of medicine. You're talking about puberty blockers? Blockers and then opposite sex hormones. And at what age does the medical transition begin with uh, medication? So medical affirmation begins when the patient says they're ready for it. So that could be a, a kiddo who is just starting puberty and panicking because they're getting breast buds or their penis is 
getting bigger and busier, and they're worried about all kinds of masculine changes. And that way, puberty blockers, which are completely reversible and don't have permanent effects, are wonderful because we can put that pause on puberty, just like if you were listening to music, you put the pause on and we stop the blockers and puberty would go right back to where it was. The next note in the song just delayed that period of time. You can just pause puberty. No, you can't. And then pick it up. No, you can't. For the future. No, you can't. How many studies do they have, long-term studies, on hormone blockers with children? None. I just spoke a month or two ago with a mother whose 14-year-old daughter was put on blockers. They discovered after two years this 14-year-old girl has osteoporosis. That's something that, like, old women get. How can doctors assure parents that a certain medicine is totally safe? If based on what you're saying, they can't possibly know that. How can they be removing the healthy breasts of 15-year-old girls? How can they be sterilizing kids? How can this whole thing be happening, Matt? Every child that they convince is is transgender and in need of medical transition, it generates $1.3 million to pharma. And we're believing a pharmaceutical company, Lupron, hormone blockers, reversible, so they say. Well, the truth is, is that in 2003, Lupron was sued and deemed a criminal enterprise by the US government. They paid the most fine of any pharmaceutical company at that time, $874 million wrote a check. Is Lupron chemical castration? Yes. We're giving it to pedophiles, aren't we? We're giving it to people that are dying, and we're giving it to kids telling them that they were born in the wrong body and it's completely safe. One of the drugs used is Lupron, right? Which mm -hmm. has actually been used to chemically castrate sex offenders? You know what? I'm not sure that we should continue with this interview because it seems like it's going in a particular direction. Well, you're a medical professional. I am a medical professional. So you don't want to talk about the drugs that you give to kids, or? Again, I'm a physician and I use medication. You're choosing exploitive words, drugs I give to I'm, kids. I'm choosing a chemical word castration. that was in a dictionary. That's not a correct term for puberty blocking. I, mean, I could like look it up person. on my phone, but I'm pretty sure if I looked it up. Like, you, you can look it up on your phone. It says medical definition, the administration of a drug to bring about a marked reduction in the body's production of androgens and especially testosterone. And I'm saying, as a pediatrician who takes care of hundreds of these kids, when you use that terminology, you are being malignant and harmful. I mean, there are some who would say that giving chemical castration drugs to kids is malignant and harmful. It's about the context of caring for a child and, and seeing the, the suffering that kids can have that have not been in affirmative home situations. What do you say to the claim that, well, we have to do this for these kids because if we don't, they'll kill themselves. They'll, they'll resort to drugs and self-harm. A lot of them were hurting themselves. A lot of them were suicidal before they even discovered gender. That is never part of the discussion. And they say, what would you rather have? a living daughter or a dead son. If this is what the professionals are saying, it's terrible emotional blackmail. Hello? Hey, is this This is, yes. Hey, it's it's Matt Walsh. Are you, where are you right now? I'm, uh, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada right now. Are you, can, are you able to leave? I'm not able to leave BC. I can't even go to another province in Canada right now. Uh, and it's because I'm technically out on bail. What happened exactly? How exactly did, did this get into the courts to begin with? Right, so what happened is we set up a meeting with BC Children's Hospital. And according to the BC Children's Hospital website, there's gonna be a thorough evaluation and I'm thinking, good, this is gonna be the end of it all. They're gonna clearly see that my child is not the opposite sex. So my ex-wife brings my child into BC Children's Hospital. I get a call, 
less than an hour into that appointment is that they were going to pump her full of cross sex hormones within the hour. And I put a halt to that. I said, no. They agreed to, to stop for the moment. They figured, well, let's get the dad on board too. This is all going to be better. Let's just get everybody on the same page. I said, it's not going to happen. So I get a letter from BC Children's Hospital in December of 2018. And it says that under the BC Infants Act, they will start injecting my child with cross-sex hormones. And I have two weeks to respond with legal action if I so choose. And so that's how I ended up in court because I did respond with legal action. So you called your daughter a she and you, you went to jail for that? It's considered criminal violence to uh, not use the preferred pronouns. It is no different than let's say I were to take a broomstick and whack one of my kids over the head. So they were treating it in a similar fashion that misgendering, mispronouning my child was the equivalent of family violence. Is she on the hormone pills now? She is. The court ordered that she could do whatever she wanted. 2010 until I would say 2016, I would say 80% of my clients were trans youth. Now it is you identify, you take hormones, you do surgery. There isn't any other pathways. So if you have two parents, one parent wants to affirm the trans identity, the other parent doesn't, who wins that battle? The one who wants to affirm. Every time? Every single time. The goal is to get the parents to affirm the kid. There's no such thing as a gender-affirming therapist. That's a contradiction in terms. Why? Because you don't affirm if you're a therapist. It's not your business to affirm. You come to see me because there's something wrong. Maybe you come to see me because a destructive element of you is wreaking havoc in your life. I'm on the side of the part of you that wants to aim up, man. That's what I'm on the side of. OK, now I don't know what that means in your case, but we're going to talk about it. Am I going to affirm what you think? No, it's not up to me to affirm it. You don't get a casual pat on the back from a therapist for your pre-existing axiomatic conclusions. That's not therapy. That's a rubber stamp. Is anybody at any point explaining to these kids the, the, the real long-term consequences of hormones and puberty blockers? I don't think they're explaining it to the kids. So that has frightened me that it's become that we're even talking to the kids about it at 10. They're, we're presenting it in schools. So this generation, they're the, they're the lab rats. Biological sex, binary. It's been binary for like 100 million years, longer than that. Temperament is not binary. Temperament or personality. So that's gender. So, Temperament is gender? Well, gender is a not a good word because it's vague and it isn't measurable. So do we need it? Why can't we just say temperament? What do we even need the word gender for? Well, I don't need it. Yeah. But what I would say is that people who talk about the diversity in gender are actually talking about diversity in personality and temperament, but they don't know it. You can have a masculine temperament if you're a woman. Maybe one in 10 women have the average temperament of a man. And you can have feminine men temperamentally. And it's not that uncommon because the differences between men and women temperamentally aren't that great. There are masculine girls. There are feminine boys. What are we going to do about that? Carve them up? You, as someone who, who started your professional life, you know, transgender care. Yeah. Now you're sitting here talking to me. Um, and I'm a dangerous man, I've been told. Mm hmm. Are you worried about? Reprisals? Are you worried about how this is going to how this is going to play among your uh, professional peers? I am worried that I can't have conversations with any other peers. I don't know any other peer that will speak to me around these things that question it. I just don't think developmentally this is helpful to our children. You step wrong as a therapist. You say the wrong thing once, and like your bloody career is over. And now it's the same with physicians. How's that going to work? You gonna go have an honest conversation with your physician when he's terrified out of his mind that he'll say something politically incorrect during the diagnostic processes? Hey man, you're sick with whatever you wanna be. See you later. You want a prescription for something? I left academia because the climate had become too stifling politically, especially when it comes to the topic of gender identity and the science of gender. It is absolutely impossible to do good research. You basically have to decide beforehand what you're going to find so that you don't upset activists, and that is not how you do science. 
Why has this shift occurred where all of a sudden gender and sex have become so politically and uh, culturally charged? There's a really ugly history between sex researchers and transgender activists. In the past, if any sex researcher spoke out about science that went against activist orthodoxy or particular narratives that activists wanted to promote, they would basically have their personal and professional reputations ruined. So what you see is that only experts who toe the party line and say the things that activists like, those are the people who get attention, those are the people who get lifted up in the media. And also I would say people are incentivized to go along with the activist narratives and gender ideology because that helps their career. Trans is very cool. Trans is a way of, of, of giving yourself value given the way society at the moment is functioning. All of the things that used to give us anchors of identity have become very fluid or very volatile in recent years. And into that context, I think what, what you find then is, is new identities start to, to fill the void or the vacuum. Whereas in the past, I might have got my sense of self-worth from being part of the village where I grew up. Now I might get my sense of self-worth through being part of the online community that I connect with, or part of the, the sexual identity community. So now we are seeing kids that are identifying as animals going to school, and they are purring instead of answering questions, and they meow, and the teachers are not allowed to question it because it's considered a queer identity. So you have kids that are going to school and they're saying, I'm a cat. Mm -hmm and the teachers have to affirm them as a cat. Yes, so it's so not just the schools are like the literal, literal zoos now, basically. They are. I am a 27-year-old transgender woman. Um, I am a wolf therian and a member of the furry fandom. When and how did you discover this inner <laughs> wolfness? Um, probably around age 10 or 11. I was watching an anime about wolves and see the wolf running across the screen and I'm somehow just intrinsically like, oh, that's me. Have you spent any time around biological wolves? Yes. That sounds dangerous also. What, what context um, are you? So I was a volunteer with a preserve and I've, I've also visited many wolf preserves. Are you able to communicate with the wolves? Am I gonna have a conversation with a wolf in the way that I'm communicating you and I? Obviously not. Am I going to read their body language, respond appropriately to their behaviors and their nonverbal cues? Yes. Would you, be able, would you be able to give us an example of this wolf communication? Um, no. I'm not comfortable doing so. Okay, all right. How exactly have these ideas become so pervasive First of all, I think we need to remember that in the West, at least, we have it drilled into our minds from childhood onwards that personal happiness is the key to individual flourishing. Secondly, we think of ourselves in psychological terms. I am my feelings. And in order for me to be happy, I have to be able to express my feelings. I have to be outwardly that which I feel myself to be inwardly. Thirdly, uh, we're taught that interfering with somebody else's happiness is very bad. We need to acknowledge that there are powerful lobby groups, powerful cultural and political lobby groups driving this thing. Uh, Hollywood is pressing LGBTQ plus matters in so many movies. We're seeing it in the way Amazon sets up its algorithms. There are all kinds of factors in society that are pushing what would really be numerically a fairly minority interest into being one of the main political focal points of this generation. After my operation, I will be a woman. Why can't she just be a lesbian? Because she's not a lesbian, Mom. She's a boy. Because I was born in a girl's body. Can I ask you a question? Why don't you kiss me? The whole idea of social contagion, that there could be something in one's social environment that could play some role in somebody coming out identifying as trans, would you say that that is definitely part of your story? When I look back, I don't think I would have ever even considered seeing myself as a boy without these social aspects, especially if I hadn't joined these online communities. I identify as non-binary. I'll officially be changing my pronouns to they, them. My pronouns are he, him, and demon, demon self. I've been going by they, them pronouns for four years now. I'm they, pretty comfortable they, with it. I use they, them pronouns. 
There was literally a period of a few weeks to a few months. I started out as an ally, and then eventually, I was starting to identify as transgender. We are trans models. So they go on the internet, and they're told that all of their problems will be solved if they become a man. Kids are being taught, you might feel like you're a boy, even if you have a vagina and you're a girl, you are what you feel you are. Some people are girls, some are boys, some are both, some are neither. Gender is all about how we feel on the inside and how we express ourselves. Ah, the gender fluid teacher. What do I go by in the classroom? I go by teacher Fambrini. As a queer and trans teacher, my agenda is to show little boys that they don't have to be like as stereotypically masculine as they can like paint their nails and wear earrings and like still be a guy and like it can be cool. So you worry that there, there could be a sort of social contagion element of this? A teeny tiny bit, maybe. Looking back on it, it was the same pattern, just kids who were really struggling, kids who were very alone and isolated. They have anxiety. They don't fit in with their peers. They don't know where they belong. Maybe they didn't have a welcoming family life. They just got caught up in these communities online. Then they discover, hey, there's this group of people. And they also don't fit in. They're different. They're not sure who they are. Gee, that's where I fit in. Today is the day before my top surgery. I am waking up tomorrow at 5 AM to have a subcutaneous mastectomy. We're telling children when they haven't fully developed that all you have to do is medically transition and you fit in. I was one of those kids. It got me at 42. Your child doesn't have a chance. Trans rights. This is only going in one direction. You will respect us. As parents, come to understand more about gender identity. Kids are coming out at younger ages. It's exciting. And you know who gets it right? Is this next generation. The next generation who's already telling us that our antiquated ideas of things have to be a certain way just don't apply to them. They're rejecting a lot of our social mores. They're tweaking the system. I just don't think it's realistic to put this decision on them that is basically saying, are you okay with the risk of permanent health effects that you can never ever reverse? How can you ask that of such a small child? I'm a physician and I use medication. Certainly it's a bit of a Faustian bargain. Puberty blockers, which are completely reversible, invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. Some women have penises, right? Some men have vaginas. Does a chicken cry? Does a chicken commit suicide? I'm not a woman, so I, I can't really answer that. I guess because I got a dick. Somehow this madness has infected our entire society. Am I the crazy one? I'm done asking questions. Tanner Cross is on administrative leave for what he said about gender identity. He said he would not call a student who's transgender by their preferred pronoun. I can't lie to children, and, and I gotta also represent a whole community that believes in biological facts and scientific facts. And I just can't, I can't do that to kids. You get into teaching because you love kids. And this policy started coming into play and I was like, wait a minute, um, it's causing me, I'm gonna have to lie to my kids, the ones I've always wanted to protect. Do we have assaults in our bathrooms or our locker rooms regularly? To my knowledge, we don't have any records of assaults occurring in our restroom. <laughs> The predator transgender student is, or person, simply it does not exist. The Virginia Department of Education says it is now re reviewing whether the Loudoun County School District has properly reported cases of sexual assault. This comes after a 15-year-old was charged on two separate occasions for assaulting two different students at different schools.
Dozens rallying tonight in Loudoun County to protest the school's policies. So that includes limiting who can talk during public comment portions of board meetings. One speaker leased property in the area just so he could speak tonight. Fox 5's Paris Jones is live with the details. That's right. Conservative commentator Matt Walsh told me he's leasing out someone's basement in Loudoun County so he'd be able to speak during tonight's meeting. I decided last week to fulfill my lifelong dream of being a... Um, a Loudoun County resident. You know, I've always felt like I've lived in Tennessee. I felt sort of like a Virginian trapped in a Tennessean's body. Um, I identify as sort of state fluid, I guess. This is Matt Wall. She tweeted, how do you do, fellow Virginian? Now I just got to explain to my wife and kids that we're going to be staying in someone's basement. They tried to muzzle me by not allowing me to speak. And when that didn't work, they tried to muzzle me with a mask. I would thank you all for allowing me to speak to you tonight, but you tried not to allow it, yet here I am. Now you only give us 60 seconds, so let me get to the point. You are all child abusers. You prey upon impressionable children and indoctrinate them into your insane ideological cult, a cult which holds many fanatical views, but none so deranged as the idea that boys are girls and girls are boys. By imposing this vile nonsense on students to the point even of forcing young girls to share locker rooms with boys, you deprive these kids of safety and privacy and something more fundamental too, which is truth. If education is not grounded in truth, then it is worthless. Worse, it is poison. You are poison. You are predators. I can see why you try to stop us from speaking. You know that your ideas are indefensible. You silence the opposing side because you have no argument. You can only hide under your beds like pathetic little gutless cowards hoping we shut up and go away, but we won't. I promise you that. Johnny's a boy with a big imagination. One day he's a dog, the next day a crustacean. Johnny's mom loves her son's make-believe time. You're Johnny the Walrus till you change your mind. Matt Walsh is out with a new children's book. The book is called Johnny the Walrus. What is this about? It sold out on Amazon in a few hours. So I have embraced my true calling as a, as a children's author, hence the cardigan. The book is about uh, a little boy who's very imaginative and, and playful and like I have four kids and they all have an imagination Yeah, and he likes to pretend to be different things and one day he pretends to be a walrus and unfortunately his mother is uh, is very progressive and thus confused and so she's convinced by the internet and by society that if your child is is identifying as something then he really is that thing and so she tries to raise her child as a walrus, as a sort of trans walrus, respecting his self-identity. One morning, he came downstairs barking and clapping, wood spoons for tusks and sock fins a flapping. He had spoons in his mouth, he was pretending to be a walrus. <laughs> I'm Johnny the walrus, he said with a roar. Johnny the walrus, This is a hot topic. Yes. That's a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's good for us to have these conversations so people open their minds and relearn and unlearn to what we've been taught. So I want this to be a safe place to talk about and learn. As you can see, there's an ongoing evolution of language and how people can identify. My next guest, author and conservative host of Daily Wire's The Matt Walsh Show, talking about his recently published children's book that has since been removed online by a popular large retail chain. Now, Matt says gender is not a social construct, but rooted firmly in biology. True? True. As human beings, we have a sex, male or female. That is a biological scientific fact. Now, gender is a linguistic term. Words have gender. People don't. You can have whatever self-perception you want, but you can't expect me to take part in that self-perception or to take part in this kind of charade, this theatrical production you don't get your own pronouns, just like you don't get your own prepositions or your own, your own adjectives. You know, it's like if I were to tell you, my adjectives are handsome and brilliant, and no matter, whenever you're talking about me, you have to describe me as handsome and brilliant, because that's how I identify. 
So you think it's a delusion? Well, this is one of the problems with this left-wing gender ideology is that no one who espouses it can even tell you what these words mean. It's like, what is a woman? Well, can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. Womanhood is something that is an umbrella term. It includes people that who- That describes what? People who identify as a woman. What is that? Was to each their own. Okay. Each woman, each man, each person is going to have a different relation with their own gender identity and define it differently. That, so you want to reduce problem. women, you want to reduce men down to maybe just their genetics, our genitals, no. our chromosomes, right? That's what you're what saying. You is that is that's a, what what, you, what you want to do is appropriate women. You want to appropriate womanhood okay. and turn it into basically a costume that could be worn. Joining us on stage is Dr. Susie Denbo, associate professor at Kent State University. Dr. Denbo, how do you feel? Those who oppose using pronouns are taking the wrong approach in this conversation. There's the extreme approach that you are admittedly taking. Um, and then there's also just ordinary people that might not be comfortable with the language change. She began by saying that my view is extreme. Okay, so the view that every single person on earth yeah. has held up until 15 seconds ago is extreme. They are conflating gender and sex because on one hand they say, well, you got your biological sex, but then your gender is whatever social construct. But then they turn around and say that trans women are women. So a man yeah, yeah. Who, ha who, who identifies with, the, with the, the gender, the social construct of womanhood, actually is a woman. Part of me wants to ask why you care so much, uh, because right, it's really right. not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah, can I answer right. that? Um, I, I care about the truth. So, so basic truth matters. I want to live in a society where people okay, care about fine. the truth. Um, I care about children. And this, these insane ideas about too. gender are being, are being foist on kids. Um, and that, that bothers me quite a bit. I care about the women who are having their opportunities stolen from them. I care quite a bit, yeah. I wanted us to have a safe place to be able to talk about this. And it seems like we should just keep the dialogue going and, and hopefully find some middle ground. What do you say to parents? A parent comes to you and says, my eight-year-old son is telling me he's a girl. Yeah, great. You're gonna have him do an experimental procedure that creates the most suicidal ideation of any other population seven to 10 years after, you know, transition. And here's what I tell parents. You don't have the right to medically transition your child. We have no research on long-term hormone use. We will be seeing the first generation of long-term hormone use. And we already know at least with 10 years of hormones, you're giving yourself cancer. What's your message to parents who are trying to cope with this? The first thing is to tell parents that they're not alone. It is our responsibility as a parent to be the frontline defense for our children. And, and I know with my child, a lot of people will say, was it worth it? Because you now you know, seemingly have lost your child. And I'll say, yeah, but at least I, I've saved my conscience and my morals and my convictions. And when my child turns 25 and says, Dad, where were you? I'll say, I was there. I was fighting as hard as I could. I was not prepared to let this happen. Does this really matter is, is another question. So matters for those who are getting double mastectomies when they're 16. Why should we care if we live in a society where gender is Well, fluid? I cared because my government decided that I had to call people by the terms that they were, that they designated, or I'd be subject to legal penalties. It's like, no, I'm not doing that. I don't care what your reason is. You don't get control of my tongue. We live in a climate now in which no one seems to care about the safety of women and girls who are going through a very developmentally challenging time in their lives. They may not want to share spaces with their male peers. I would not be surprised in a few years, there will no longer be women's sports. It will literally be men's sports and transgender sports. The question being asked by the trans person is, is a legitimate one. How can I be happy? 
the answer being given by having my body transformed to look like the other gender by having myself pumped full of hormones clearly isn't working. And we have to find a better and the more humane way of dealing with individuals who are struggling with gender dysphoria. I have the utmost compassion for people who suffer from gender dysphoria. It's a nightmare for them and their families. The vast majority, up to 90% of kids, if they go through a normal puberty, they're gonna be okay. They will be at peace with their bodies and they will have avoided dangerous and experimental medical interventions and surgeries. Maybe we're up against a battle here, up against a hill that perhaps, you know, we're not gonna necessarily win today, but if we don't pave the way for a win, we'll never get there. So we're going on this journey. Boys can be girls, girls can be boys. Men can be women, women can be men. It makes me wonder, what, what is a woman? What is a woman? A woman is someone who claims that as their identity. It could be many things to many people. I think the question really brings up the, the fact that it is pretty relative, right? That if you ask women across race, across identities, across class, um, across culture, um, you will get a different answer. Some of it is, you know, based on biology. Some of it is based on hormones. Some of it is based on what you wear and, and how you present yourself. A woman is not anything in particular. It's not, there's no one particular thing. There is not one particular thing. A woman is someone who says that she is a woman and transitions to be a who woman. Who says that she's what? Can you define the word woman without using the word woman? And it's actually kind of like, it's a curious question, um, but I... We've been journeying across the country asking people this question, and almost nobody can answer it. Uh, what is a woman? What is a woman? Marry one and find out. Mm-hmm. So I should go home and ask my wife, I guess. Yeah. Hey, I've been uh, meaning to ask you this. something. Uh-huh. What is a woman? An adult human female who needs help opening this. Mm -hmm.